All right, and so as you can see, uh, in contrast, prosecution expert witness uh, didn't know things, forgot things, didn't really understand the procedural rules, changed his opinion. So there's a clear distinction between the two. In order to delve into this a little deeper, I would like to ask David to come up and uh, talk a little further about the distinctions in this case. From a, uh, you know, from a primarily defense counsel perspective, but I think any, any litigator's perspective, uh, the most important thing uh, for an expert witness is that the expert witness has to be a great teacher. Okay? And I think that you saw that the uh, defense uh, uh, expert was a great teacher uh, and the, the prosecution expert was not. But what do I mean specifically when I say you have to be a great teacher? Uh, it doesn't mean that you have to be a great lecturer. Uh, lecturers put people to sleep. Uh, people don't follow lectures. What you really need is the expert witness to be a great tutor, somebody who is actually engaging with the finder of fact, uh, whether it be the judge uh, or, the, or the jury, somebody who is engaging with the finder of fact and is you know, intimately taking that person or those people through uh, the tutor's logic, why this makes sense, and the, and the finder of fact is listening to that and is saying, yeah, that makes sense. Even though I'm not necessarily an expert in that particular area, what you say accords with my common sense. And therefore, you're able not only to get the judge or the jury to understand what it is you're saying, you're getting them to buy into it because it, it sells to their personal <coughs> experience. That is the ultimate uh, job of an expert. So if you think of him as a tutor, then the person has to realize I have to keep my eyes on my audience. I need to make sure they're following what I'm saying. I need to explain it to them in a way that they can understand and relate to and, and buy into. And I'd like to illustrate this by taking just two uh, under 20 second clips from uh, the defense expert, Dr. Uh, DeMaio. So we're gonna, uh, we're gonna show that first 20-second clip. You've seen it before, but um, uh, as, as part of the longer uh, clip of Dr. DeMaio, but this, this, this little scene illustrates uh, how great a teacher he is. But let's just, I don't know, yeah, let's just put, put it on hold for a second. Um, this relates to the specific issue of, of who is on top. Is it, uh, is it uh, Dr., excuse me, is it George Zimmerman? Or is it Trayvon Martin? And the defense obviously wants to show that Trayvon Martin was on top of George Zimmerman being the aggressor. And therefore, George Zimmerman underneath is engaged in, in self-defense. So the issue is, is who is on top. And let's, let's show how Dr. DeMaio conveyed it so simply that, uh, uh, as to who is on top. If you lean over somebody, you will notice that the clothing tends to fall away from the chest. If instead you're lying on your back and somebody shoots you, the clothing is going to be against your chest. So what, what is he doing? He is communicating in a slow way. He's acting it out for the, for the jury. He is he is, he is getting across in a common sense way. Here's how you know that this guy is on top. He's relating it to the jury's own sense of how things work. They can, they can kind of act out uh, what happens with clothing falling away uh, from their chest and they can relate to it. And then uh, I want to show the next uh, uh, 20 second clip from Dr. DeMaio, which is essentially making the same point but it's making that point through, in, through the vehicle of saying the shirt is wet and therefore uh, you know, wet shirts are gonna kind of go down further. So he's reinforcing the theme that Dr. Zimmerman had to, uh, excuse me, that George Zimmerman um, uh, 
was, was underneath and that Trayvon Morton was on top. So let's see that. The reason that the clothes, as you bend forward, the clothing falls away from the body is gravity. Now, if you have wet clothing, clothing's heavier, and there's going to be a greater tendency to fall. So he's using very clear, simple concepts, and the, the, the people who are being tutored, the judge or the jury, they can actually, they're almost feeling or they're remembering, yes, I remember when I have wet clothing, how that feels. I want the clothing to be away from me. If I want the clothing to be away from me, I'm, I'm going to lean over. And this also illustrates another point, which is when you, when you want your expert to underscore a point as being very important uh, and you don't want a point to get lost, very often you really do want to repeat that point. But you have to be very respectful of the time of the jury. And you have to be careful that you don't want it to be perceived as repetition. So you make a slight change in how the uh, information is being presented uh, so that you end up reinforcing the theme but not having it appear as if you are as if you are uh, repeating testimony so that's the that's the right way to do it from my from my perspective um, I want to just talk for a second about um, uh, dr. Uh, bio uh, who was obviously not a very good uh, communicator he was the ultimate inscripted uh, he brought he brought his notes literally with him, which was a surprise to everyone, including including the lawyer who was putting him on the stand. Um, and you feel for him, and that's obviously uh, you feel for everyone there. But uh, it, it's obviously an extreme case. But the re reason I mentioned scripting is uh, experts tend to be scripted, uh, even if they're not reading from notes. Uh, a lot of experts, they like to get everything down so perfectly, I'm going to present it this way. Sometimes you as the lawyer want to present it uh, in, a very, in a very careful way. And it's great to be careful, but it's essential that you not come across as being scripted. And if the expert is busy reading the script, he can't really be a tutor. Because when you're, when you're being a tutor, you have to, you have, to have eye contact with the, uh, the people that you're trying to teach. You have to see that you're, that you're selling it. And you just can't do that when they're scripted. You're better off saying to the expert, just you know, don't worry about the words. Use your own words. As long as they have the substance down, that's right. Um, the clip that, I'm, that I want to mention and, and talk about, though, uh, is, is a different subject. It's, it's where he changes his mind from three minutes uh, to 10 minutes, which you saw before. And unfortunately, it does happen that people uh, uh, do do change uh, their mind. And let's see that clip. And it continued to be one to three minutes until the last 60 days. Yes, until three weeks ago. Until three weeks ago, and then you changed your opinion Best and expanded time. it to more than twice, almost three times as long, more than three times as long, yeah. from one to 10 minutes because I have new experience. And that's experience, personal experience? Yes. Okay, this is the exact wrong way for an expert to change, to change his or her mind. Uh, the rule, obviously, is that you try to reduce uh, the need to change your mind, to, for the expert to change his or her mind. And the way you do that is to have the expert read everything, consider everything, consider what the other side would would say before the expert's deposition is taken. And yet, I see it time and time again that uh, the expert doesn't really consider everything before the deposition is taken. That minimizes the risk that there will be a mistake. However, it happens more frequently than you would want that there is going to be a mistake. And the question is, how, does, how do you train your expert to deal with a mistake when it happens? And I think the answer is that you want the expert to deal with it honestly and forthrightly and in a way that preserves the expert's credibility. Um, for that reason, and also to have a little element of surprise, uh, when I'm questioning uh, an expert and I think that the expert has made a mistake, 
uh, I'm going to uh, I'm going to try not to uh, bring it up on deposition, but bring it up at trial and and see how the expert deals with it on the stand. And the expert is is, is you know has basically two choices: they could either uh, recant their their opinion or whatever they said earlier on the spot, uh, which you know which, which which is not very not very attractive to them, or they could dig in. And, and undermine their own uh, credibility. And it's important to prepare an expert that if you are surprised with something, just testify as to the truth. It's not going to change the main uh, aspect of your testimony. It's important always, uh, uh, you know, there are always going to be little glitches. It's important that you deal with that uh, in an honest way. Um, so that's my perspective, and I, I'm curious as to uh, the judge's perspective on on these witnesses, and I'm going to sit down and allow a, a discussion from others. Yeah. Uh, no, I think you're right on the mark there. Uh, the the critical thing from any witness, but particularly an expert, is there's a bridge between the witness and the trier of fact, whether it's a judge or a jury. And it's important that the witness uh, gain the trust and confidence of the judge. I can speak firsthand on that. Judges need help. Uh, they don't know every field of the law, even though they're brought into every field of the law. They're generic. And that, therefore, you try the judge tries to see who can I rely on. Uh, is this person telling it to me straight? Is that person trying to spin me? And I remember one case that I had, uh, the Keating case, where the expert for the government uh, flat out, when he was questioned about a matter, he says I was wrong. He made a mistake. And that endeared me to him. I, Realize he was he was being honest. He wasn't trying to pull the wool over my eyes. And uh, uh, this here, I think, you see the contrast uh, that are incredible between the the um, uh, the two expert witnesses. Uh, that it's almost unbelievable. Wasn't there something in there about him having to turn over the notes to the to the uh, uh, he had notes and the cross-examiner said to him, may I see those notes? And the judge had to tell the witness that he had to turn the notes over. So he, 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 a lot of this is not only the witness. First of all, you should try to get the best expert witness that you can find. Uh, you as a lawyer ought to know that. You ought to interview the person. You ought to do a dry run with that person. You ought to put them on video. And, and you should know that. And, and you should also know uh, uh, if there are any problems in the testimony, you got to know that. And you've got to try to correct it before uh, the other side makes a big to-do about it once the person has taken the stand. So when we see somebody testifying this way, uh, it's one thing to say, well, you had a a bad witness, but it's another to say, where were the lawyers here? Why, weren't, why wasn't that person prepared better? Why were there so many uh, surprises? There shouldn't have been any surprises. And I think you'd see that the defense counsel had, did a, had done a better job of preparing the witness than the prosecution. So the prosecution, the lawyer, has to accept some of the, the blame when a fiasco like this happens. 